malo lavele soi fua malelangi e mama o te fa a talo fa tu ile pa ia mali mama lu o tato aulia so su mai te tala mai o ao ile nei aso tena koto tena koto tena tato katoa kia ora everyone welcome 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 to our third audience atlas Aotearoa live Q and A session o ai yau who am I o lo wingo o Paul Lisi my name is Paul Lisi, Arts Practice Director, Pacific Arts, here at Creative New Zealand Toy Aotearoa, and I will be your facilitator today as we focus our talanoa on Pacifica audiences and the market for Pacific Arts. But before we begin, I'd like to open our session with a pūre, or a Cook Islands prayer. So, pūre mai tātou. Te atua, ki a wai mai to awaroa, ta kinga nei taki ki runga ye mātou nei i te uri uri manako anga no ta mātou anga anga nei. Aro a mai koe i a mātou nei. Āmene. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Paulisi. My family hail from the Samoan villages of Manono on the island of Uporu and Ngātai Wai on the island of Savai. I have brown skin, auburn coloured curls down past my ears, uh, a dark moustache, clear framed glasses, a pink button shirt, and I am beaming in from Albany up here in Tamaki Makoto. I want to thank you for joining us today, um, our third session on our series of sharing some of the insights from our latest Audience Atlas research, designed to help arts and cultural organizations, artists and arts practitioners understand the needs of audiences, as well as the value and potential of the arts and culture market here in Aotearoa. If you've joined us for our previous live sessions, you may have already heard some of this information, particularly around the culture segments. So we really appreciate you coming back and joining us today. The research is from a representative sample of the New Zealand public to give us an audience perspective and help us better understand how New Zealanders are engaging with different art forms. This zonal today will have three parts. First up, we'll go through and explain the research approach and culture segments. Then we'll hear and learn more about Pacifica audiences in the second part. And to finish off, we'll look at the market for Pacific Arts in Aotearoa. Now, I know there's going to be a lot of information in today's session, but there will be plenty of opportunities to ask any questions as we go along. If you do have a question, you can pop it in the chat box to the right of your screen if you're uh, both on Facebook and YouTube, and we'll do our best to get those answered for you as we go along with our session. We also have our amazing colleagues from Toy Aotearoa in the background who may also be able to answer those questions in the chat as well. Uh, I want to say a big whatwhitai te le lover uh, to our interpreters from Platform Interpreting New Zealand who are joining us this morning, as well as our friends from Auckland Live who are making us look really flash. And just a friendly reminder for those of you playing at home that this live stream will be recorded and posted on our Facebook page after the event. So you can share it with others or you can watch it again. <clears throat> now, Joining me today, live from New York, uh, to go through the Audience Atlas research is the amazing Andrew McIntyre, a co-founder of Morris Hargreaves McIntyre Research Consultancy and a leading authority on audience motivations, behavior, and responses in the arts, working with clients across the globe. So um, Andrew, like I mentioned, is joining us from New York, but is no stranger to Aotearoa. Uh, MHM also have a small team based here in Aotearoa and has frequented our shores many times before COVID. Uh, this is the fourth edition of Audience Atlas Aotearoa. Uh, the first study was conducted back in 2011. So we've been working with them to provide this research every three years as part of our ongoing commitment to provide uh, real practical insights on audience needs, as well as the value and potential of the arts and culture market for the sector. Uh, MHM is renowned for using market insight to make a real difference to the organizations they work with, not only for arts, for arts marketing and audience development, but also for curatorial programming and educational practice in the sector. Uh, and so without further ado, Andrew, ma lo lovele soi fua, and now over mm -hmm. to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Really lovely to be here. Um, I am literally dialing in from the past now. I'm 17 hours behind you here 
in New York. Um, so I'm really dialing from yesterday, but I'm um, uh, lovely to see so many people uh, uh, on the call. Um, as Paul said, we are going to talk a little bit about this uh, COVID um, uh, uh, study to start with um, before we share some of the, the data. I'd just like to say a few words really about, about what's happened in, in COVID. Um, I don't know if we could have the, um, the first slide for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, COVID's affected most countries in the world. And, um, you know, we've spent most of the last two years being really jealous of RTRO, um, as you were, as you've fared much better than many of us. But I know how hard it's been for you more recently. Um, I was just joking earlier that I was glad to escape the UK. I flew to the States earlier today. In the UK, there are 3 million cases now. One in 20 people has COVID. Um, and we are, you know, if, if that gets much worse, we're starting to, to face uh, some consequences for the culture sector again. Um, so it's, it's been really difficult for organizations, but I think it's also been particularly different, difficult for individual practitioners. And, and for many has really, really, um, you know, challenged their kind of the way they make their living. Um, we've seen different responses from government and from funders and, and so on, and, that, and that's made a big difference. But for me, I think the big, biggest lesson looking at this in Aotearoa, in Australia, in the States, in Sweden, in the UK, is that generally speaking, I think the organizations that have the deepest audience roots are the ones that have come through this um, much stronger. Um, and uh, as a little bit of a spoiler, what I will tell you is that um, if anything, the experience of COVID has actually strengthened the bond with the audiences for those organizations. So although they've had a difficult time, we have a number of clients who are literally telling us that they are um, almost overwhelmed by the amount of support that they've been getting. I have to say that we've met quite a lot of organizations who had very, very shallow audience routes. The, those organizations that have been more transactional maybe in the way that they approached um, uh, their audience, just selling tickets and not really trying to build community or build relationships. Those organizations have really struggled. Um, and it's almost, for, for many of them, it's almost like starting again uh, to build the audience again from, from you know, fr from this really big setback. So uh, um, uh, I, I just like to say that at the beginning, because we're going to share quite a lot of data with you, but I, I, it is this thing about building community around your institutions and around your practice. Um, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's just a fantastic thing to do. Um, and if any of the data I'm going to share with you tonight helps anyone on the call to strengthen and build more community around your your organizations, then it'll have been a worthwhile hour to, to uh, or 90 minutes to spend together. So um, Paul talked a little bit about the study itself. Um, it's, a, it's quite an amazing uh, thing, uh, Audience Atlas uh, um, RTRR. Um, this is the fourth edition. It's a national survey. Uh, this time it reflects the responses of 6,743 people nationally, and that's representative of the whole of our TRO's uh, demographics. So it's region by region, the correct uh, uh, number of people. It's uh, done by gender, by age, uh, and also by, uh, we have a way of doing it by social class. So it's as, uh, and it's as close to that as we can get it. And then uh, for this year, we've also had additional quotas on ethnicity. So there was a, an additional investment made to boost the responses from those identifying as Maori, uh, Pacific peoples and Asian. Uh, and so this is you know, po possibly one of the, the most faithful um, pictures of the the, uh, the the diversity and breadth of the Aotearoa audience that's ever uh, been done. Um, and so the increased number of responses we have ensures that we can report on all of those groups with some degree of confidence. Um, so 
the uh, the headline here is that 96% of all New Zealanders um, report engaging in culture in the previous three years. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by culture in a, in a minute, but it's a very broad definition of the term culture. It could be pretty much anything that you do actively. You can see from this little map that that compares well to other places uh, around the world. Uh, the UK there is 85%. Um, and that's the equivalent of 3.9 million individuals. Um, what I can also tell you is that um, that uh, 324,000 of those identify as Pacifica. So, uh, and that comes out of, uh, out of the statistics in the study. So that's 324,000 adults age 16 and over uh, who are in the market for arts and culture and identify as Pacifica. And in the study itself, we have responses from 432 people, Pacific peoples. So that's 8% of all respondents. Um, and the different Pacifica groups mirror the census. So we have Samoan, uh, uh, Cook Island, Maori, uh, Tongan, uh, Fijian, and so on. So all of those are uh, represented. Um, so we're fairly confident that this is a, you know, a sample that is representative and really you can start to hear their voice come through in this data maybe uh, more loudly than it has in previous editions. Um, so the, um, what makes this study actually unique? Um, well, there is a few things about it. First, the, that it doesn't just ask people, what do you do, your current attendance? We do ask that, but that's not all we ask. We also ask about what we call their lapsed attendance. So um, arts and cultural activity that they've done in the past, but not in the last three years. And I should say, for when we say three years, this study, this is pretty much the pre-COVID period. Um, the, um, so we've got, I've been recently, and I've been to that, but not recently. But we also ask another question, which is, would you be interested in potentially trying this cultural activity or art form in the future? So we also know about their potential future attendance. So we're looking backwards we're looking forwards and we're looking now. So it gives us a complete picture. Um, so there may be people we've had and we've lost, people we've currently got and people we've yet to get. And of course, all of those people can be profiled and we know where they, where they are, we know who they are, we know what they are. Um, and so that means that this is not an exercise of looking in the rear view mirror or of just telling us what we already know this is really an exercise of looking forwards. It's about opportunity. It's about where can we where can we take our audiences next? Where are the potential audiences coming from? And we also have done it by looking at, at 12 core art forms. So they are Pacific Arts, Na Toi Māori, Asian Arts, Theatre, Dance, Music, Literature, Museums, Visual Arts, craft and object art and film. So those 11 we've done in all four editions, but this year we've added a 12th category, which is festivals. And we are very pleased that we did because festivals gives a whole flavor to the way that people not only engage with arts and culture in Aotearoa, but also um, illuminates how they might actually begin to engage with some um, art forms and, and, and genres because it turns out that kind of this is fairly obvious maybe but it turns out the festivals are a kind of foyer for for all of those art forms people can encounter things that they haven't been to before they can dabble in them they can try them out things that you wouldn't necessarily um, deliberately book a ticket for and turn up to a venue on a particular night to go and see, you can just come across it at a, at a festival or just take it in at a festival. And it's a way of trying new things. And so festivals are a, a fantastic uh, entry point for a lot of people to a lot of art forms. So this is, this is really added a dimension to what we do. Now, all of um, all of this uh, um, is being um, uh, profiled in the usual way, demographically, you know, how old are you, 
are you male or female? You know, have you got children? Where do you live? Um, we've got all of that, um, lots and lots of it. And sometimes that gives us some really interesting data. But more often than not, there isn't much of a pattern uh, in some of that data. You know, people in different places and people of different ages are kind of similar in lots of ways. So we have a second way of, uh, of understanding the data, and it's this, which is uh, culture segments. So culture segments, um, some of you may um, be aware of it already, um, but culture segments is a really interesting way of profiling uh, uh, the audience. Um, it's uh, rather than being a demographic thing, looking at people's age groups, it's a psychographic tool. And that means it, it, um, it profiles people, not by how old they are or where they live, but by um, their motivations, their deep-seated values and beliefs. It, in a way, if you like, it, it tells you why people engage with culture, and it tells you possibly why they don't. And so um, uh, it's much... It has a you know, very powerful uh, effect if we can understand the culture segments of the audience you've got or the audience you're targeting or the audience you've lost, then um, you know, uh, getting them to engage and engage more deeply with you is a lot easier than just by knowing their birth date. Um, so this is a way of, of getting some insight into how and why people engage. Um, it's been around for about 10 years. Um, well, I say that, I think it's probably 12, because I don't know if you find yourself having to add on two years for COVID. I, I, all my estimates are off by two years. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's just a thing I'm finding at the moment. So, um, but it's been around for more than a decade. It's, it's, um, it, it was very, very early in the, uh, in, in the New Zealand market. And New Zealand was one of the very first countries to, to, uh, to have a lot of the, uh, culture segments data. But it's now in about 15 countries um, uh, worldwide. Um, and it really does tell us a lot about uh, how people do. Now, there's, if you haven't segmented yourself, you'll see at the top of this slide, there is a URL. It's mhminsight.com forward slash. Uh, that should say segment me, by the way. Uh, at the top, I think it might do segment me. Um, I think there's probably somebody can um, put a link somewhere else as well as I'm speaking. But um, uh, I think you're all able to multitask. So this thing, when you click on it, takes 60 seconds. So you are, I'd encourage you, to, if you haven't already segmented yourself, to have a little go, click on this link, uh, forward slash segment me. And, uh, and, uh, and while I'm speaking, you can, you can take the quiz and it'll give you your segment within 60 seconds. It's quite fun. Uh, you can do it as a party trick on your friends and family later. But um, it also might make some more sense of what I'm about to tell you. So please do have a go if you've got a phone or you can do it on your screen while you're listening. So let's, uh, let's have a look at the cut segments quickly. There are eight segments. Um, they are quite sophisticated. So they're not eight cardboard cutout stereotypes. Um, you know, there are obviously more than eight types of people in the world and there are more than eight types of people on the call. So this is really about um, grouping people together who have a similar mindset, who approach arts and culture in a similar way. And they're similar enough to each other to make it worthwhile addressing them as a group. And they're different enough to the other groups to make it worthwhile addressing them as a group. Um, and so I'm gonna go through the eight groups um, uh, and, and just give you a bit of a flavor. So let's look firstly at this one, essence. So essence are called that because arts and culture is literally essential to their life. It's like oxygen to them. If you took away the arts and culture, which actually we did during COVID, it is like cutting off their oxygen. Um, you'll find that this group um, uh, online um, use more online um, art and culture uh, uh, than anyone else during lockdowns uh, worldwide. <laughs> they just couldn't get enough. Um, but it's because they were literally cut off from the oxygen of the real thing. And what's also really interesting is when you ask them whether they thought it was any good, they score it relatively low compared to all the other segments. And that's because it's not as good as the real thing. Um, and so, um, and so they, they take it rather than nothing, but, um, but, they, uh, but they were just desperate to get back to the real thing. So uh, Essence are, if you like, they look like our core audience, don't they? You know, they're, they're super enthusiastic. They are 
avid, they are high frequency, very knowledgeable, very confident, try lots of things, um, but they're incredibly discerning. They are in search of the best of the best. They want uh, art and culture experiences that transport them, that transform them. So they're in search almost of self-actualization. That's what they're pursuing. Um, and they can tell you, if you ask them what, what's the um, you know, most incredible art and culture event they've ever been to, they will recall it instantly and they can tell you exactly how it made them feel and where it was and when it was and what it was, because it's almost like a peak moment in their lives. And they keep going to more and more things looking for that. Now, the problem with that is that they are, they've been everywhere and they know what really good stuff looks like. And so they're quite discerning to the point of being picky. Uh, and also to the point where they're so fiercely independently minded that they almost could be contrary in the fact that they would enjoy liking things that no one else likes and they might enjoy not liking things that everyone else likes. So <laughs> there's a, an element here where they are very, very, uh, um, uh, uh, um, they have a very high worth, but they're also very high maintenance. Um, so you have to work very hard to get them and to keep them. But um, so that's essence. And I should say that most museum curators, um, many uh, um, uh, artists uh, are in, in, this, uh, in this box. You'll also find that a lot of scientists are in this box, for example. So they are very, it's a, people who are very single-minded and are very, uh, very uh, engaged. Um, so, my second segment I'm going to show you is expression. Expression of people, people. They are community minded and communally minded. Um, they uh, want to be part of something bigger than themselves and they want to give something back. They are hardwired to support cultural organizations because they think that's what makes society civilized. Um, they think that we should all use it. They are particularly fond of organizations that work in the community, that uh, make uh, arts and culture accessible to everyone. So, you know, if you do lots of things for children, even if they don't have children, they'll think that's fantastic. <laughs> um, you know, so, um, so the, the uh, uh, and the more you do to make uh, it more accessible and the more work you reach out and the more egalitarian you are, the more they like you. So this, uh, this group doesn't want to be invited to uh, some kind of swanky private view behind the velvet rope. They would like the open day where the whole city turns up <laughs> all together, everyone from every kind of background and is just in a shared experience. So that's what they want. They want everyone to come together through arts and culture and it, it, it's powerful and it's emotional and it's, it's, uh, it, it moves them and they love any kind of expression. So they appreciate um, high quality expression, but they equally would like it if you put children's painting up, paintings up on the wall, because they would think, isn't that amazing that the children have made all of this work? So they, they know the difference between it in terms of quality, but they don't, they don't make a distinction in terms of its value. Um, they think that all, all creativity is, is to be respected. Um, let's have a look at uh, stimulation. I'm in this segment, uh, so I'm a little bit biased, but <laughs> I can make a make it sound really, really, really uh, good, good nice. So, so we like we like big ideas. We like things that are kind of surprising. So we like it when you break rules, where you combine uh, one art form with another, or you bring together science with music or something with whatever, and you do it in a place or a space that. I wouldn't normally be expecting it at a time. I wouldn't normally be expecting it in a format. I wasn't expecting it before. Uh, so we're always hunting the, the newest thing. We want to, to, to you to blow our mind and we love anything visual. Uh, so we like it to be about something. We like it to be authentic. We like it to be live. We like it to be um, have a thrill. Um, but we, uh, we, we just want to be constantly pushed. And we also want to be the first to know. So what you should really do is leak your plan to us and we will tell everyone on your behalf. Um, that's, uh, I know that's a bit needy because in, people in stimulation like other people to think that they're in the know. So we see you could tell Essence and they would be very pleased you told them. They'd probably keep it to themselves. 
because um, possibly, possibly because they don't want other people to come. Um, whereas stimulation, it's like gold dust information we can spread around. So like, I know about this really good thing. Um, so nothing ever went viral on the internet without stimulation getting behind it. We are the people who make things go viral. Um, you know, there's no point telling the other segments, uh, they, they won't help you. But tell stimulation, stimulation will, will, will spin it up for you. Um, we, uh, we are quite fickle though. You, you know, there's always something really exciting happening down the road next week. So, um, so you know, we are, we're, <laughs> we're kind of, a, and we have a very short attention span. Um, okay, um, next up, our affirmation. Affirmation are amazing as a segment. They are people who, as adults, have made a very conscious decision that art and culture makes their life better. It, it just, you know, they're going to be and almost not just make a better life, but almost makes them better people. There's a kind of self-improvement element to this. It's like if I read lots of books, I'd be a better person than if I didn't. So kind of going to lots of arts and cultural activities is a kind of worthwhile thing to do. You know, if you spent your weekend doing laundry, um, you know, it would feel like you hadn't really achieved much. But if you if you went and did a cultural activity, it would feel like you'd spent the time well, you know, and you'd got something from it. Um, so they are constantly looking for things to do, new things to try, places to go. The problem is that they need a high level of reassurance and endorsement so that they, they're up for the idea of trying something, but they need a lot of um, a lot of reassurance that it's the right thing to do. That's why festivals are so good, um, because you can try things without with a relatively low risk. Um, in lockdown, all the stuff we put online, these people loved because they could try anything without risking too much. You could dabble in if after 10 minutes you didn't like it, you could turn it off, couldn't you? So um, but then you hadn't traveled into town and you hadn't paid money and you hadn't whatever. So they're just looking for a higher level of endorsement than most of our organizations uh, uh, usually think they need to give. And that's because usually we're talking to people who are already in the audience. And these people are not quite in your audience, but they would like to be, um, but we don't give them anywhere near enough reassurance. But they are, um, once they have discovered you and they've got over the anxiety and they've decided that you're good, they just keep coming back. They're super loyal. Um, okay. Let's go on the bottom row here. We've got enrichment. Now, I said earlier, you know, these are not demographics. So you will find people of every age group in every segment. You'll find people with families in every segment. However, um, enrichment does tend to track a little bit older. Um, they are, um, they see the present through the lens of the past. That's what I would say about them. They, they are quite nostalgic. They, um, they, are, they want to hang on to things that they value from the past. So they worry that the modern world is going to destroy things. They're not totally against modern things. They just think that there are things that are valuable that we should preserve and hang on to. And that could be historic buildings. It could be, you know, it, it, could, be, um, it could be social norms. But it, I'll tell you what else it could be. It could, it could be the environment. It, they, they, they are quite keen on, um, on environmental protection because they think that the modern world will destroy the planet and they want to preserve you know, beauty and, uh, and the land and so on. So, so, um, so they tend to look backwards in order to understand the future. They like narrative. So they like the story of this is how it was and then this is how we got here. Um, they are not against new things. They're just a little bit wary of them. One of them said to me in the focus group once, I don't think all modern art is rubbish. Some of it might be brilliant, but we won't know which is the good stuff for another 20 years. <laughs> so it's almost like they want everyone else to go and try it out. And then they'll come along when, when we've all worked out which is the stuff that's good. So if it's still around in 20 years time, it's still the test of time. It's, <laughs> so they like things that are endorsed, things that are acclaimed, things that are famous, um, and things that are treasured. Um, and they're quite traditional. And so let's go to the next one, which is perspective. A perspective are interesting because they are usually quite knowledgeable about something. And so it could be a particular art form, a particular genre, a particular um, 
anything. It could be a topic, a subject matter. It could be anything to do with astronomy and space, or it could be anything to do with, you know, um, nature and whatever, or, or it could be, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it could be a historical period. It could be anything, but they tend to be really quite um, a little, a little bit nerdy about it. So, so they've probably read everything. They're probably one of, they're probably on lots of internet groups to do with it. So, and they're, on here, they're the one segment that's not looking. Everyone else has got fear of missing out, except this segment already is happy with what they've got. They like reading, they like nature, they like gardening, they like anything that is absorbing, uh, affective, that, that kind of can, that can lose themselves in, changes their mood. And they don't, they don't hanker after being part of a big crowd somewhere. But if you've got something that chimes with, cuts across an interest that they have, then, and you can find them, they will be super interested in whatever it is you have, but they are quite elusive. Um, the next segment up on the block, penultimate one is release. And again, this is a slightly uh, different segment because um, a, a lot of the people in release are used to be in another segment and actually might be in another segment in the future. We think that the segments don't really change that much. If people change segment, they do it very slowly across their lifetime, maybe. Um, or, and if they do change, they probably end up in the next door segment. Um, so they're not pinging across the map. But um, release is full of people who are time poor, time poor and or stressed. And so a lot of them say, oh, I used to do more arts and culture, but I haven't got the time now. I've got kids and a mortgage and a busy job and whatever. When am I going to have the time to do any of this? And so they tend not to even have the time to find out what's on. So they find out what's on by just by word of mouth or by it's everywhere. So it's, you know, it's got to be on the radar. And it's almost like if I'm only going to do one thing, what would be the one thing? So there's no point sending them a brochure of 20 things. They literally only want to do the one thing that everyone else says that they should do. So they tend to stick to things that are quite prominent and quite well known. Um, it's interesting because my wife was in this, like the quintessential person in this segment for a number of years. Um, our kids uh, left home, went to university, and uh, she uh, retested as affirmation suddenly her life was very different and now she's like solid affirmation so i should have said by the way that, you know affirmation read every single review going we've never had a bad restaurant meal because my wife has read every single review going and it's the same it's the same how she chooses her theater shows um okay so finally um we have entertainment now, entertainment are kind of the odd one out because there's only nine percent of them in the market um, they don't have a category called arts and culture. They just have leisure. Um, everything is leisure. So bowling, going to the beach um, going for a meal, and going you know, to a, a concert, going to whatever. It's all just leisure. And so we're literally competing against everything. And what they really want out of a leisure attitude is fun. They want to be distracted. They want to have a good time. They don't want to work too hard. So, you know, they don't want to turn up to a museum and be told to go explore. They want to know what time is the person going to tell me about this. You know, if they take their kids, they want you to entertain their children. <laughs> so, so this is about uh, getting a big reward for your money. And, and a lot of what they do is very mainstream. We didn't used to be able to compete in this category too much um, because they like bigger is better. So if it looks like Disney and it's on TV, it's probably high quality in their view. So, you know, advertising is how they found out about the world. We couldn't really compete. But now with the internet, you know, for $50, you can make something look like Disney, can't you? So, so if you've got the kind of content that they'd like, it is, they are possible to get, but they are actually a relatively small segment. Just a quick little note on marketing. Um, this is going to disappoint you if you have marketing in your job title. Um, essence think that marketing is for other people because they already know about stuff. So they ignore marketing because they think it's not for them. So if you want to tell them something, please don't make it look like marketing because they will avoid it. So you need to make it look a bit like information and then they'll read it. 
um, expression will look at marketing and that's sometimes how they find out about things, but really they want to be on the inside. Like when they join your Facebook group, they literally want to be your friend and they think you're going to chat to them and you think you're going to, and we're all in it together. You know, in fact, you, they'd like you to ask for their help. You know, we did a thing where we asked expression, whether they, if we sent them a poster, whether they would put it up in their local area and 65% of them said, yes. And then few of them contacted us, several people different uh, separately and said, don't waste all of your money printing all those posters. Email us a PDF of a poster. We'll print it out at home and we'll put it up for you. So this is kind of, um, it could be like the, um, the, the um, you know, the paramilitary wing of your marketing department. You could literally, <laughs> literally uh, you could literally deputize hundreds and thousands of them to uh, help you. They just want to be on the inside. Um, stimulation, love marketing, but as a kind of sport. So we kind of scan the entire internet looking for everything um, and then and sift out the cool stuff. Then we tell everyone else about the cool stuff. Actually, if you do some really bad marketing, we'll find that and laugh at you and, and share that as well. Um, so don't do that. Um, affirmation, uh, look at marketing, but they don't believe it. They don't trust it because everything says this is the best show and they know that that can't all be true. So they're looking for an independent verification, that word of mouth, reviews, whatever. Actually, if you quote word of mouth and reviews in your marketing, then they'll believe that. But they don't believe it if you just tell them it's good because why would they believe you? Um, uh, enrichment, think that marketing is what's wrong with the modern world. Um, they think it's an American import and couldn't we just go back to before marketing when there was just information and you could make your own mind up. Um, uh, perspective are not looking for your marketing so they won't find it. You've got to go and find them. Um, uh, release are too busy to find your marketing. Um, so they're just waiting to, for it to, you know, somebody to tell them what, what, what they should see. And entertainment are pretty much the only segment on here, and there's only 9% of them, and they just want fun, um, who love marketing, because marketing is gospel. Marketing is how they find out what's on, and they, and they believe it. Um, pretty much everyone else is doing something else with your marketing. So the point here is, is that you need to build relationships where you can have dialogue and conversations with these people rather than just think we can sell them things because we can't. So I'm going to just pause there and then hand back to Paul. Um, wow. That's, that is a lot of information. Thank you so much, Andrew, my um, fellow stimulation. Um, I think as you were going through all of them, I kept saying, yes, yes, it's me. Oh, that, that is also me. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, over the next few years, I guess, where um, where mine might land. Um, I just really wanted to, to pick on a few things that, that you mentioned. I think one of the big um, things that I've picked up from, from your talanoa um, is the importance of festivals. And I think that's been a really key part of um, I guess, specific identity within Aotearoa. Um, so it makes complete sense that that is um, a really big factor in terms of what we deem as arts um, and culture, because technically within a Pacific um, lens, art and culture are the same thing, or um, our histories are expressed through the arts or what um, what people traditionally see as arts. So it's um, it's really great that there is actually more research to back that, that up. And um, also um, touching back on one of your earlier points around the boosted sample of, of Pacifica people, I think we've um, seen a lot of um, surveys within our community where we feel that um, a lot of the time we're not the representation is not there or the representative voice is not as big enough as it should be. So it's really amazing to see that there was um, inclusion of, you know, um, Tongan, Nuean, Fijian, Tokelauan, um, you know, a, a real large range of, of ethnicities because, again, we're not a homogenous culture. There are at least 17 nations within the Pacific. So um, really awesome to hear that that was um, a key focus area. So um, I'm really interested to um, see what the, the research has kind of said about Pacifica audiences and, and what they are within those culture segments, which I guess you'll be, you'll be touching on in, in this next segment. So back over to you. Okay, thank you very much. So let's have a little look 
a, a dig down into those uh, Pacifica audiences. Um, if I could have the slide for that, thank you. Um, so first of all, seeing as we've just done the culture segments, let's have a look at them by culture segment, because this is quite interesting. Um, so if you bring this slide up, there are the eight segments and a little reminder of what they do. In the first column of figures, that is the Aotearoa market. That's how, what percentage of each segment there are in the Aotearoa market. And in the blue column, that is uh, how they fall in the Pacifica audience. And so where it's blue, it means it's uh, lower. There are fewer of that segment. And where it's red, um, it means that they are outperforming the, the market. So the big two things on here are that 30% of the entire Pacifica sample are expression. Um, and it kind of makes sense because expression are the community people, they're the people people, they're the belonging people, they're the network people, they're the people who want to belong and join in and, and have very really strong community bonds. Um, and, but the 30 versus 20 is huge, huge. You know, if it's two or three percent, we're making a big deal of it. Um, <laughs> that's half as much again as as the rest of the rest of New Zealand. Um, and the other one here is release, which is 17 percent rather than 12 as the national average. That is uh, interestingly, usually a sign of people being super busy. And um, there are lots of reasons people can be busy, but um, nearly always when we dig into these numbers, it's uh, people who, uh, if you look at the people, the number of average number of hours people work, um, it tends to be more, and particularly where people have more than one job. So, um, so uh, release is highest among uh, people who have more than one part-time job. So if people have got two jobs or three jobs or whatever, and they've got kids and they've got whatever, that's when release tends to go through the through the roof. So people are working lots of hours um, is, is what you normally get. So so they're the two big standouts in terms of culture segments. Um, the uh, most of the rest are kind of within, you know, the bounds is really small on perspective, quite small on entertainment, too. Um, but this is um, this is this is a big deal. So almost half of the population are in those two. You know, it's interesting. Um, let's go a little bit further and find out a bit more about what it is that our Pacifica audiences are looking for from a cultural uh, activity. So we use a little model here where we, we, we give people a big laundry list of, of reasons why you might go, motives to, to visit, the outcomes you're looking for from uh, an arts and cultural activity. And we built this list by asking people an open-ended question is what you're looking for. And we just built this enormous list. And then we made the list and we showed it to all 6,000 people in this study, including all the Pacific audiences and asked them which of these are the ones that best describe why you go. And we've divided those into four types. So we have social um, and social um, uh, uh, motivations are, are really about spending quality time with friends and family and doing things that are, you know, for, that are to pass the time and so on. Intellectual, which is really about learning things and wanting to know more and, 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 and to, to, to have something to think about and talk about. Um, emotional, which it covers a lot of things. It can be aesthetic beauty. It, it can be personal identity. It can be, uh, it can be to be moved. It's empathy. It's all of those things. And then spiritual, which can be reflective, it can be escapist, it can be stimulating your creativity or your imagination. So it's all of those things. So, um, so let's have a look at what people said. Well, the, the top things uh, are these. Um, so spending time with family and friends, um, expanding knowledge and collecting the, ex uh, uh, collecting the experiences seeing new places and doing something out of the ordinary so these are social intellectual and these are broadly in line with um with the rest of new zealand however um let me show you a second lot of these because this is where uh, pacifica start to 
look different. And it's, it's oh, sorry, gone too quickly. Um, it's these. So uh, significantly higher um, for things like stimulate your imagination. So it's like 26% in the overall market. I think it's 33%. Pacific, so that's big. It's like a third of the audience said that this is one of the main reasons that they go to arts and cultural events. Um, but this is really interesting. It's um, to better define their cultural or personal identity. That's 30% are saying that, 30% are picking that. You know what it is in for the rest of New Zealand? 12. <laughs> 12. <laughs> so this is huge. This is huge. This is an enormous driver. For why, why why these people are, are choosing, um, they're also uh, um, doing uh, um, food for the soul, which ticks up a little bit higher. I like, I like that as a phrase. We uh, took that from somebody's phrase. Um, experiencing a deep sense of awe and wonder. Um, again, I think it's like nineteen or twenty percent plays fourteen. Be part of a communal shared experience. Um, and I think, uh, again, that's about 19 versus 13 average and a deep feeling of personal connection. Uh, and for that, it's almost twice the national average. It's, again, about 20 versus nine. So um, what I'm going to tell you is that Pacifica audiences are um, really emotionally and spiritually engaging with the work that they're against. That's why they go. Um, you know, they want what everyone wants, nice social time and a, 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 an intellectual, but they're really seeking things that are quite profound from their, uh, from their activities. So let me show you that in a little bit um, more statistical detail, which is this. Um, so we're, um, like the whole of New Zealand, uh, when we ask people for all of their motives, we get social coming out at 79%. Like, so this is people who've picked at least one of the social options is 79%, it's the top answer. Um, and then you get intellectual and then emotional, but spiritual is high. This is emotional, spiritual here, much, much higher than they are for the rest of uh, New Zealand. Um, so you could, but when we ask people to pick the main one, you can see that, um, if you look at the pink and the green to the right hand side here, it's 31% are, are, are picking spiritual and emotional as the main reason for go, which is much, much higher than the, 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 the normal average. Um, what I would say about this is that whilst obviously that's profound and really interesting, the big message here is that these are not in competition with each other. Um, we all want to have a good social experience. We don't want to have a bad social experience, but great art. You know, so going, you can't divorce the social aspect of attending anything from what you get from it. And in fact, um, what people are doing here is they're, they're using social as a gateway to getting these deeper rewards. So people are coming together um, and enjoying being together as a shared group, whether it's with people they love or with the community. And uh, as part of that shared experience, they're getting something um, uh, much deeper. And that chimes before with the slide I showed you about 30% uh, of the audience are expression, which is all about that shared experience, all about the community coming together. So this is about um, a communal social experiences um, that lead to powerful emotional and spiritual outcomes for people. You know, they get other actors as well, but this is they're feeling it really deeply. So this is like some really powerful stuff. This is higher than the Maori uh, results. It's higher than the uh, higher than the average. Um, so this is like this comes out top. Um, so this is all fantastic until I show you the next slide, which is this, which is that we ask people if they've been if there's any barriers to attending. Now, we didn't just say, oh, one of the barriers to attending, here's a list. What we actually said was, was there an occasion that you wanted to attend an arts, cultural or heritage organization or event and something prevented you from doing so? So they've got to think of an actual instance. I really wanted to go to that, but something prevented me. Now, for the whole of New Zealand, it's like 30, 
uh, 6% or something, it's 45% per Pacifica. So 45% of the Pacifica audience say that they something prevented them from attending. Now, there's a whole lot of reasons why that could be. Um, but that is a lot of people. That's 147,000 out of our 273, I think it was, um, who said that they've been, you know, they've been, that there's a barrier to, to attendance. And when we ask them what the barriers are, the biggest one is price. Um, there's other things on there as well, travel and, you know, um, you know, COVID and, you know, things not being on locally and things. But by far, the biggest thing is price, by far and away. And what's interesting here is, is that we're finding this across the whole study for all audiences, but more for Pacifica than for any other audience. It's, it's higher it's higher than for Mari, and Mari is higher than the national average. So um, the more diverse the audience is, the more priced out they're being. And uh, you know, one of the biggest findings of this study is we really, really need to um, do something about pricing. And that's not about reducing all the prices, it's finding access points for everyone finding ways in which people can access what we do. And there are lots and lots of imaginative pricing schemes around, lots of them. Um, um, and people are doing all kinds of things like, uh, some of them are doing very public things like, you know, you can get tickets on the day for cheaper, or there's a certain number of tickets on standby, or those kinds of things. They are bringing in some imaginative concessionary prices. Other people are doing it more discreetly. They're working with community organizations and others to make tickets available to partner organizations and through organizations that will target the kinds of people who might be priced out. But um, the one that I uh, actually only found out about really uh, since I've been doing this is from New Zealand, uh, from, from in the International Arts Festival, uh, cooking up this um, choose what you pay uh, idea, which um, you know there, there are other things, Battersea Arts Centre in London has done a kind of pay what you want um, for some time. They're finding that they're, they're, they're making just as much money out of it as they make out of having ticket pricing, but nobody feels priced out. Literally no one feels priced out. Um, there are people that give more than they would normally pay and they enjoy doing so. Um, and nobody is made to feel awkward or difficult about it. So there are lots and lots of other models that we could go into, but 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 access pricing is just crucial. Um, and particularly, I think, for younger audiences. Um, if we don't get younger audiences into the habit of coming to these events, then you know, I don't want to see what that hap what well, it looks like in 10 years' time if we wrote it forward. We have to build audiences and we have to build them now. And if there are people who want to come to our events but can't, then we need to do something about it. And these figures are too high. So, um, so I think you could be really creative. I think you could be really imaginative. You could do a little bit of research into what other models are, what other people are doing. Um, but it, it, it's, it's something to really think about. Um, talking of uh, money, um, we also asked people about online. So have a look at this. So this is, um, bring it up, there we go. So, uh, no, have I just gone backwards? Yeah, there we go. Um, so this is engaging online. So there's about 22% of, uh, of Pacifica audiences said that they've engaged online recently. There's another 40%, twice as many. For everyone that's done it, there's two more that say, oh, no, but I would, I, I'd be interested in giving that a go. Um, and it's higher than it is uh, nationally. Um, so it's, uh, it, yeah, so it, 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 it's, it's significantly higher. Um, and then if we ask this second question, which is, would you pay for that content? Um, it's it's uh, it's significantly above the, uh, the 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 average. So four in ten people said they haven't done it but would consider. Um, so this is um, this is a a potential market of something like one hundred and twenty four thousand people say that they're in the market for paid online engagement. So this is the next frontier, I think, uh, of um, 
uh, you know, creating work online. Just worth saying at this point that all the studies we did through COVID were showing that there was a real difference from the beginning of COVID to later, where the beginning people just threw everything online, see what stuck. And there was a lot of stuff. But people very quickly worked out that there's a difference between art and culture that you can access it in some way online and art and culture that's made deliberately for online that's actually better online than it would be in real life um an expression remember they were the 30 percent of 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 the audience here what they really wanted wasn't just access to the to the art what they wanted was a sense of community so they loved events that were live, where you felt part of something, uh, and events where you could actually interact with it or, or see what other people were saying, and you could feel part of the community and part of a shared experience were way better than just some, well, some kind of video on demand. So creating uh, online experiences uh, that have excitement, that have a sense of occasion, that have a sense of shared experience, that have a sense of interaction, these are experiences that are more worth paying for than ones where you just pay to access some video feed that, you know, is online anyway. Um, and so there's quite a lot of interesting work about what people want from online and what they're willing to pay for. Um, sorry, I didn't do my paid for slide. There's the paid for slide. So you can see it's a lot lower than people who've just been online, but it's still significant, that 38% is still a huge, big lump of people. So, um, okay, let me uh, show you something a little bit different. These are the core art forms. Uh, you know, remember I said at the beginning there were 12 art forms. Uh, Pacific audiences are more engaged in eight of the 12 core art forms. So this is, they significantly beat the national average for engagement. So Pacific audiences are higher in film, festivals, Pacific arts, you might think that, na toi Māori, Asian arts, craft and object art, dance and literature. And you can see on the right hand side where these little arrows are pointing up, you can just see how many, uh, how much higher they are percentage points than the rest of the market. This is astonishing. They're 70% more likely to be at festivals, 20% more likely to be at Asian arts, 16% more likely to be at dance. I mean, these are big numbers, yeah? This is, this is some serious level engagement <laughs> with, with arts and culture uh, and some specific art forms here that are really blowing it. Obviously, you might be expect that they would be more engaged with Pacific arts in which is 36% more, but, um, but you know, they're 16% they're more likely than the, than the average uh, to be engaged in Natoi Māori. So it, it, this is kind of interesting to see just how avid they are. Um, and then if we ask, what have you engaged with in the past three years? Um, film always wins. Film's always number one in every, in every, in every slide. But, um, but again, on the right-hand side, you can see by how much more. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, and even with visual arts, it's a, it, it takes up a little bit higher. What's interesting here is if we start splitting that by age, and one of the things here is, you know, we're only showing you a little bit. There is a huge audience atlas report with a vast amount of this data in, and you can all go and download it if you haven't already and poke around in it. But I've just pulled a couple of slides from it. I mean, literally, this is two from, you know, 100. Um, but have a look at this. This is the audience for dance. Remember, it was 16% more likely for dance. Um, you'll see on the left-hand side, um, this little graphic equalizer. On the left-hand side, we have culture segments. So you can see Essence here on the left-hand side at, oh, sorry, Let's see if I can click on see the slide. There we go, sorry, right slide up. Um, you've got um, Essence of 14% more likely to be engaged in dance and uh, expression, I think 8% more likely. The rest kind of the same. And then those other segments, enrichment per um, perspective and so on are 20% less likely. So there is a real difference in culture segments, but I'd like to draw your attention to the age, which is the, the blue bars in the middle. 
look at the difference for young audiences, young Pacifica audiences, 70% more likely to be engaged in dance. So they're driving that dance engagement in a huge way. So this is just one little example. You could pour through the report and pull out your own, but this is the kind of detail we can have. We can say, well, this is dance in New Zealand, and we can look at, oh, well, let's look at the extent to which Pacifica audiences engage in dance. Oh, look, it's more. And then we could drill down into that and say, oh, look, it's Essence and it's under 25s. So what we've just found there is this huge uh, little thing, which is young Pacifica audiences are driving a boom in dance. And so are we on that? Are we, are we, <laughs> are we across that? Are we fully explaining that? And, and whether that's, um, whether that's uh, organizations that are doing that or whether organizations who don't have this audience and would like to have it, uh, are they catering for this audience? Uh, because there's a, there's a lot of people here are driving this dance boom and maybe a lot of mainstream organizations are unaware of this and are not targeting them. So this is the kind of data you can pull out. Let me show you another one. Um, See, I'm just going to flick between those. Oh, sorry. If you, if you look, you're familiar with the little bars. If you just concentrate your eyes on the bars, I'm going to move from dance to festivals. See what it does. Boom. See, you get a different, you get a, uh, you get a different uh, pattern. And um, what we're looking at here is uh, what this shows you is, apart from those three art forms that are still not engaging on, in uh, three culture segments not engaging, all of those culture segments are doing. You see how broad festivals are. As we started this at the beginning, festivals are not just for essence. They're not just for one thing. They they attract more. Now it still attracts more younger people. Fest younger people like festivals, but it's across the board in terms of culture segment, and that's why it's so valuable because you don't have to be in a particular culture segment to get festivals. Festivals are a great melting pot. They're a great meeting point. They're a great entry uh, uh, point, a gateway to other arts and culture. Um, if you have children in your household, you're slightly more likely to like festivals as well. So I'm, I'm gonna park that there and hand you back to, to Paul again, but I hope I'm just kind of trying to tease out just how engaged this audience is and the kind of detail you can ferret out if you've got half an hour and you want to poke around in the report. Malo Lava, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, again, so many, um, Fantastic insights, and, and I would say also a lot of the things that you've mentioned are things most likely our Pacifica audiences are very already know. Um, you know, if you're looking at um, in terms of the data around younger audiences, you know, 46.1% of Pacific people are under the age of 20, um, and we have really strong engagement um, through. Uh, different pieces of work here at Lee, our Pacifica Festivals initiative around the large numbers of um, school-aged children who are taking part in, in those cultural festivals or in those festivals full stop. Um, again, not really surprised at all around the high numbers in dance. Um, for youth, I think the part of it could be um, the really strong influence of culture and the importance of dance within culture. And again, how those are inexplicably linked, but also, um, you know, the, the fact that there are many dance groups or uh, many youth who create their own dance group crews. I was in a dance group when I was 15 or so. So, you know, it's it's a kind of um, communal thing that I think it's great that the data um, supports so that organizations like us or like other dance organizations can see the value in, um, in that particular audience. Um, I also want to touch on um, what you were speaking about, about the online space. You know, I think um, another thing that we uh, we know intrinsically is that our our youth are very much engaged online there is such a high engagement online um, that we are working towards through our Pacific Arts strategy and um, kind of formatting or formulating under the hashtag digital Moana you know because it's taking note and stock of the fact that this is a, 
a preferred form of communication or engagement or um, connection that our youth have. So how do we then tap into those to make sure that those audiences or those youth are getting the right or getting the, their fill, um, or so to speak, of, of the different art forms that we have. So this is um, amazing data that I think um, kind of backs up the, the work that we want to do, continue to do, and are doing uh, in this space. So really, um, thank you for um, drilling down into, into those um, really useful pieces of information. Again, I also want to reiterate what Andrew said. This is but a small fraction of the information that we have on our website from this research. So if you did want to kind of chop and change and see um, some of the other things that we might not have had time to touch on, please go to that website. But I'll just um, throw back over to you, Andrew, for this last segment that we've got um, for our Talanoa today before we open up for questions. Once again, if you have any questions or any comments, please put them uh, in the chat um, on your screen below. But uh, back over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Paul. Uh, one thing I just want to add about the digital, which is that um, youth is, is, is big, big, but the other really important audience for digital that we should mention is people with lived experience of disability. Um, that, you know, lockdown across the world has been a boom for them in access. There's been all kinds of events and open mic nights and all kinds of other things shared online that have built real community for those people and, um, and which has just opened access up in, in all kinds of ways. And I think their biggest fear is that as things, like if it goes back to normal, that organizations who have put time and effort into putting things online and making them accessible will take them back offline and they'll go back to the real, you know, real in real life. And that that will exclude quite a lot of people. So it's a, you know, there is a huge audience there. It's about 14% of the market um, have a lived experience of disability. And we ignore that market at our, at our peril. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge market. So it's, it's worth also adding that. Okay. So let's look at um, how the wider culture market engages with Pacific arts. This is kind of an interesting question. So we've looked at how uh, people who identify as, uh, uh, as Pacific peoples uh, 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 engage, but now let's look at the wider market. So um, here's the first stat. Um, and the first stat is that 47% of New Zealanders uh, say that they have engaged with Pacific Arts in the three years prior to the study. Um, a large amount of that will have been via festivals. But, but that is enormous. That's half. Remember, there was 96% of the population were in the culture market, and almost half of them are, are saying, yes, I've engaged with that recently. There's a further, and that's 1.9 million people. So when we're talking about, you know, the size of the market, <laughs> this, these are big numbers, you know? Um, if we then take that one step further, there's a further million beyond those who say, well, I've engaged with it, but probably not in the last three years. So that's 2.9 million that have had some kind of experience of it, know what it is, or got an idea of what some of it might be. Um, and then if you keep going beyond that, you get another two thirds of a million, 632,000 in this case, that say, I haven't engaged, but I'm open to it. That sounds quite interesting. And there's only 10% of the whole market that says, yeah, not, not for me. I'm not interested in that. Um, so that's 90% 90, 90 of the entire culture market is either actively, uh, historically, or potentially interested in engaging. This is enormous. So this is not a niche um, uh, activity. This is not something for specialists or something for people who've got some kind of, you know, uh, deep personal connection. This is pretty much everyone has some level of, of, of openness to it. Um, so if you put, try to put that into some kind of numbers, what we're actually starting to look at is that 
Um, Forty-seven percent are in the market, but the mar that market is younger than the average. So, which half? If half of the people are engaging, which half is it? Well, it's uh, it it tracks younger, very much definitely. Um, but it's not just about age; it also tracks um, to be more diverse. So, what's interesting is that. 69% um, identify as New Zealand European. It's 79% for the uh, for the wider market, um, and it's it's you know there is 19% uh, uh, Maori versus 15% of the population, 14% uh, Pacifica versus 8%, and so on. Um, so it's and then as I said, 14% has lived experience of disability uh, who are engaging it. So this is half the half of the population pretty much but it's that that half tracks a bit younger they're more likely to have children and they're more likely to be diverse so you can see the kind of flavor of that audience as you start to build it um if we have a look at who's in the lapsed market remember the the million that said well i've been but not recently um let's see how they look um well they're a little bit different um, they track a bit older. I mean, this is the kind of the corollary. They track a little bit older. 55% of the lapsed people, oh yeah, I've done that, but not recently, are over 55 years old, whereas the average is 32. So this is much older. Um, but also, um, what they are, as you might imagine, less diverse. Um, I've gone two slides forward, I think. Um, so you can see that they are a less diverse uh, audience, so significantly more New Zealand European, significantly less likely to have children, and significantly less likely to have an experience of disability. So what we've got is a large number of people have had an experience of this, but the ones that are currently with it tend to be younger and more diverse. And then if we look at the potential audience, that's 632,000, um, there is, far less to distinguish them. They're kind of average. They're a little bit older, may, maybe, um, but it's it's not not so much. Um, the uh, If there is an uptick, it's significantly more likely to be Asian. So uh, there's more Asian people in that potential market than there are uh, in, in the wider market. But let's have a look at where they are. Uh, we haven't done any geography yet today. So let's, let's have a look at some geography. Um, Okay, so this is where the current audience lives. The darker the green, uh, the, 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 the stronger the uh, level of engagement. Um, Auckland uh, uh, is the winner, may not surprise you, um, but 53% of, of uh, the, the, the market there has engaged, um, as opposed to 47, that's 700,000 people. Um, if you then look at where the lapsed audience uh, live alongside, um, what you'll find is that um, uh, it's really just in the main population centres. I think it's like 350,000 in Auckland, uh, 110,000 in Waikato, 100 and similar number in Wellington, and 150,000 or so in Canterbury. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it really just follows where the population live. Um, uh, you know, not so much in the same way as the as the current audience. And to complete the picture there, let's have a look at the future potential. And what's interesting there is uh, is that um, is is if you look at the west coast and Canterbury, uh, there's a lot of untapped potential there. So you know, it's um, uh, that's where it is. But the you can see the pattern here is is widespread, younger, more diverse more families and then the older less diverse than whatever you are the more likely you are to uh, dropped off or let's be kind and say occasional um but but the 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 big growth engine of the market is younger and more diverse um so let's go back to festival where we started Paul. Eh? so have a look at this as a slide um 885,000 people so best part of a million have engaged with the Pacific Cultural Festival in the past three years. This is 
where it's happening. This is the front line of wider engagement in this uh, whole basket of things. And you can uh, look at the top there. That's the uh, Pacific Arts Market at the top. Um, Pacifica Film. You see Cultural Festival there. You can see Digital Video Art, um, Craft Object Exhibition, um, Music Concerts, um, and Dance, uh, bring it up the bottom there. Um, so this is huge, this, but this is about, this is about where can people, um, I suppose, encounter this art and culture in a way that is, they feel is accessible uh, and has a lower level of barrier or risk and festival is, is the answer to that. Um, now, these are the people that say that they've done it in the past three years, that's 85,000. Again, let's drill down into the people that say they have done it, but not recently, more than three years ago. And it's this. So here we have another 600,000. And you can see uh, how the figures work out there. And then again, we can look at the potential for that. And what's really interesting in the potential here is that's actually at the top that's the uh, um, Pacific Arts Market. But look at these. It's pretty much the same thing. It's like one and a half million plus for all of these things. And these are people who are thinking, I'd like to try that. I'd like to try that. I'd like to try that. So um, we're kind of nailing the festivals. <laughs> it's working. Um, there's an awful lot of people out there open to, interested in, willing to try, have done, this before. Um, I suppose the challenge then, um, not just for the organizations that are already programming festivals, but the challenge I think is to the wider, uh, more mainstream um, uh, uh, cultural uh, organizations and venues and so on, is that this is work that like vast majority of the population are interested in seeing but at the moment, although we're seeing how fantastic festivals are, they kind of have to go to a festival to find it. So my challenge would be, why isn't this being programmed in a more mainstream way? Why have you got to go searching for it? There's a lot of people here say they're interested in a lot of different genres and art forms, um, but they're not necessarily finding it uh, where they would normally get their culture. So they're having to go somewhere special to find this thing in that special place as a festival. Great that they're doing that, but why with such a popular art form? You can't imagine other art forms that had this level of interest and popularity that would not be being programmed by most of the organizations in the country. So the, the, the challenge is if this is um, RTROs, you know, uh, some of Arturo's most popular, uh, high level of interest and potential uh, art forms. Why aren't more organizations embracing this or, or showcasing it or platforming it or giving it space? Um, so that's that's the provocation I think I will leave you with. Um, I'm going to uh, re reiterate what Paul said about questions. Um, there are a couple of links there. Uh, there's also the downloadable link for the, for the whole report. Um, and I'll give you a little glimpse of that here, which is um, a bit of a montage of the kinds of pages you would find in the report. Uh, obviously, you can't read any of that, but you get the kind of idea. Lots of graphs, lots of data, lots of lots of lots of uh, lots of insights being shared there. Um, I think it's a treasure trove. Um, we've only skimmed through it, but I hope I've given you a kind of shape of what's in there. Um, if you download it, you will find your own interest you'll find something that really interests you in there some of it may validate what you already know some of it may refine your understanding of what you think you know some of it may confound what you think you know um but it's not a one-way process um again even this report is just a skimmed representation of a big data bank that, uh, that we're sitting on. So if you have questions like, yes, this is great, but what about this? Then please, you know, you can ask questions now, but also when you've gone through the report, ask more questions because 
chances are we have the answers, but we just didn't pull them out and put them on page 73. So there is data in here for everyone. And if everyone can find some data that helps them to engage audiences more deeply, then we've done the job. So thank you and back to Paul. Oh, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, again, I don't think I can reiterate how much um, these results kind of resonate with everything that we see. Um, and um, it's great to see the, I guess, the synchronicity around what we um, know from our communities, because as Pacifica people, we are very, um, I would say, connected with the communities that we represent within uh, Te Aotearoa, but also across uh, many different uh, arts organisations as well. So it's really um, heartening to see that the data actually backs up what we are experiencing and what we are seeing from our communities and what we are hearing from our communities as well. Um, and I also just wanted to um, touch on, I guess, the, the challenge or, or the weddle that you've laid around um, other arts organizations thinking about this massive potential. I think it's been something that we um, have been trying to um, trying to bring to the fore um, for a very long time, particularly when we work in institutions like the one that we currently do and also across um, other arts organizations, is how do we get um, people to take notice of of this potential audience or of, of this information. So this is, um, I guess, amazing fodder for us to kind of dive, deep dive in, but also make sure that there are, um, there are ways in which we can get um, organizations to really think more diversely around what it means um, to be in this space. Um, I also want to um, give a shout out to um, Lucy Favor who, who left a lovely comment on our page, uh, but also touching on what you touched on, Andrew, around accessibility. Um, it would be remiss of us, as, as you have said, to forget um, about our community who are in the disability space. So I just want to acknowledge that there is also data in, in this research that talks to, um, talks to the, I guess, the information that we've received around um, disability audiences that have a disability or are working in that space. So thank you for um, continuing to acknowledge our people because again, it's, um, much like you said, we don't want to forget them once the world opens up again, or there's that inequity of our access, which well, is something that, that we hear. Uh, well, I think often. Paul, that there, there, there's something like, I, I haven't got the exact number in front of me, but there's something like a thousand uh, respondents in the sample uh, who have a lived experience of disability, um, which is a very powerful voice. You know, that's a, that's a big study. <laughs> that's a really big study of, uh, of people talking and sharing their experience of engaging with, with arts and culture. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot in here to dig for. Absolutely. Um, and so I think, um, I don't know if we've had any questions come through, and that's totally fine. Um, you know, it's, it is, again, a lot of information to digest. Uh, we do have an email address if you want to contact us if, by some chance later on in the day, you um, have a question for us. So please, the email address is um, research at creativenz.govt.nz. Um, I'm pretty sure it is, uh, but one of my lovely colleagues will pop it in the chat for us. Um, I do have some pre-prepared questions, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind us. Yeah. We, should say, Paul, that we should say, Paul, that every single question will get answered. So, um, so the ones we haven't from the previous sessions, we've we've been busy answering them, um, uh, you know, afterwards. So every single question will get answered. Absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to um, maybe dig a little bit deeper into uh, Pacifica festivals or Pacific festivals. Um, in your experience, can you think of a similar art form overseas uh, that would be as popular as as Pacific festivals in your experience? Oh, that's a, a interesting question. Um, hmm. um, or similar numbers or kind of on my head I can't um, okay. I'm, I'm actually trying to think of, of that as a as a um, what 
it, it, it's an odd analogy, but I, I've done quite a lot of work in Ireland. And over the last 20 years in Ireland, there has been a huge resurgence in um, in more uh, uh, indigenous, I suppose, I Irish content, uh, Irish language content, and and uh, content that is uh, art forms and dance forms and music forms that are um, that that were in danger of being lost. And it started off as a kind of, you know, some interested people that wanted to keep that stuff alive and then it grew a bit, whatever. And then it benefited from a kind of boom in folk music and people um, liking a trend of things being authentic. And it's now kind of, you know, headlining festival stages and, you know, it's, it's huge. And, uh, but what's happening there is kind of what I said is that all the mainstream venues and theatres now program it because it's built a market. And so why would they not want to program it? Um, uh, so it started in its own little ghetto, but it uh, is long since broken out of that ghetto and uh, and lots of mainstream crossover things, Irish dance or all kinds of things, but Irish music, but but um, it's now it's now like solidly mainstream. Um, you know and, and and that also means that more pra more artists and practitioners are making a living out of it. And so the, the the level, the standard, the professionalism and whatever has gone up and up and up. Um, but that doesn't happen until mainstream venues get behind it. Because, yeah. And, and you know, I mentioned in the culture segments earlier, things like the affirmation audience, they don't come to some obscure little venue to see it because they're too, they don't have enough faith in it. But when it's on at the big theater, they'll go because it's on at the big theater. Um, and so, and so, for things to to um, break out of um, a kind of smaller audience into that into that middle audience, that mainstream audience, um, venue is as much as important, or presenting organisation is as much as important as the actual work itself. Uh, people need to see it in alongside and in the same light as other um, art that they already know. Absolutely, and I, uh, I guess the the example that comes to mind that has those same linkages again would be our Pacifica festivals because it it would have um, a lot of our mainstay Pacifica festivals like our ASB Polyfest up here in in Auckland, um, you know, started off as kind of small small get-togethers between different schools. And so it's continued to grow into this um, much bigger thing. So it's um, it's a great example of how um, that kind of trajectory could look like for Pacific, um, for Pacific festivals here in, in New Zealand and making that, that comparison, I guess, around what, what some of those trends might be as well, which is great. Um, I know we're we're running short on time, so just before um, we we end, please, if you also still have questions, um, fire them through. We'll try and get to them um, at some point. But um, Andrew, to to kind of wrap us um, wrap this Talanoa up, what would be one one big thing that you would want people to take away from um, from our um, chat today, or one main thing that you'll want people to take away from the data? I'd like to go back to where we started. Um, when I was talking about COVID, I was saying that the organizations that had fared the best were the ones that had built the deepest roots um, with, with community, built community around their institutions, built community around their organizations. Um, the, there has been a kind of meta trend internationally of commercializing art and culture um marketing has been at the forefront of that and it's been about the kind of science of selling tickets um and organizations that have fallen into that kind of trap have ended up being very transactional and so they're only as good as their last show um and they and then, then they're chasing the audience and they're chasing ticket sales the organizations that have built community built relationships built dialogue 
have partnered with people, have put down those roots in, in, in communities, are the ones that are really uh, flourishing, I think. Um, what the data told me was um, the Pacific audiences are huge on expression, which is the people, people, community groups, huge on it. Um, and that when they engage, they are engaging really deeply. And they're engaging more deeply in most of the art forms than anyone else in New Zealand, and, by, and sometimes by some distance, but they're also getting more out of it. The, it's about identity, it's about, it's about uh, imagination, it's about uh, really um, you know, big, uh, powerful, profound outcomes from, from, from the experience, as well as the, the coming together for, of the community of that shared experience. So um, I think to understand how we can use this data to build more community, but if you're not in this community, and you're, you're coming to find out about this community, this is a community you want in your audience. These are super audiences. Um, if I didn't have this audience, many of these people in my audience, I'd want them because they are, they're, uh, they're more interested, more active, they're more engaged, um, and they're more willing to go online. They're more willing to pay for online. They're more, <laughs> they're more, um, they're getting, you know, they're, they're more likely to get more out of it. Uh, they're younger, they're more diverse, they're what, what's not to like. So, you know, if you are nurturing those audiences already, I hope this strengthens your hand. Uh, and if you don't have these audiences, use this data to, to, to get them, because these are the audiences you want right in the center of your, uh, of your organization. Absolutely. And with that, um, I can see that we're, we've, we've run out of time. So I just want to reiterate that we hope that you've learned just a wee bit more about audiences and, and the massive market for our Pacific arts and artists, and particularly how this information can be used uh, to further your work and further the aspirations of our arts aina. Uh, I encourage you to head to our website to see the full data set again to answer any further questions you might have. Um, but again, the email if you want um, to ask us any questions, that's research at creativenz.govt.nz. Uh, we would also love your feedback to help us understand whether this Q&A and the research into audiences uh, is relevant and useful. So uh, it's just a five minute survey. So the link will be in the chat and also on our event discussion page. Uh, also a heads up, uh, we will be having another session of the near future focused on Asian audiences. Yes, we've heard the call from the sector about including our wider ainga or family in this type of talanoa. So please keep an eye out for that session coming out in the future. I want to give a massive Malo uh, Fafitai to Le Lover. Thank you to Andrew and the MHM team, uh, particularly you, Andrew, for joining us um, at all sorts of hours um, over the last three sessions. We really, really do appreciate you and your team's mahi on this. Um, I want to thank Auckland Live for partnering with us. Um, also our amazing uh, friends over at Platform Interpreting NZ. And lastly, I just want to thank you for joining us today. Um, and with that, I just want to close us off with a karakia. So, me uh, inoi tātou. He ata ki runga, he ata ki raro, he ata ki te whakatūtū, he ata ki te whakaritorito, he ata whiwhia, he ata rawea, he ata taonga. Haumi e, hui e, tāiki e. That's all from us. Again, hope you enjoy the rest of your day and hope you and your ainga keep safe and well. Soi fua, ma i manuia. <laughs>